Um, well, thank you guys for having me, for putting on such a wonderful conference. Uh, I agree with everyone that's presented so far that uh, the presentations have been, have been extremely good. Um, uh, until now, so we'll. Uh, uh, I say that because it's a Sunday morning, and I, I've I've tried to, to skew a little uh, uh, less formal today. In fact, there are almost no numbers in this, which is a bit strange for me. Um, so we'll see how it goes today. Uh, back in uh, I think it was July when Mike contacted me about doing this, I promised him one thing, and that's what's on the list. In fact, that's what I told. Uh, um, that's what I told Kim the title would be, and I've changed that. In fact, I changed it this morning, so uh, uh, this is what you get. So the first thing I want to say, since this is a student or a student run, and there are many student conferences here, I want to say some, a few things about students. Comments from the uh, Aksai Rimak. I made up this term. It means in Quechua the, uh, the cleanup speaker, which is a baseball metaphor. So I'm a few metaphors in, uh, in terms of uh, what I want to say, but I figured it made a certain amount of sense. Um, so again, since this is a, a conference run by students and with a lot of student participation, I wanted to say that um, the students, the, the work I'm going to have here is, is, is new work and is work that, again, you'll see is very much in its, in its infancy. But it wouldn't really be, it wouldn't really exist without impact from students who've, who've, uh, who've either inspired me to do it or have actually done the work. So some of this is going to be work that, that actually is a co-authored work. Um, but the, to, this is to say that uh, students can have an enormous impact on your work, and I want to give you some specific examples um, of this, at least from my, my work so far. So first, uh, what I consider acceptable number of interviews is, can be exceedingly low. You saw Philip the other day. He has tons of interviews and was managed and managed to do many interviews for his work, um, and, I, and for some reason uh, that task has always been daunting me, for me, so it's, it's been inspiring to watch him do that. Um, enthusiasm is contagious. Uh, this is from some students that I have who work in Quechua. This is Bethany Bateman and, and Sarah Hubble. Uh, swearing in a presentation is pretty damn fun. Uh, that's something I learned from Mike. Um, uh, my coding skills are never good enough, so this is, uh, this is something I've learned from Joey. And my stat skills are never current enough. This is something I've also learned from Joey. Most importantly, um, linguistics isn't always about language, and that's what really what this presentation is about. Um, so there are two, and I want to point to two um, sort of influences in this language, in this presentation specifically. One is Kim Waters and Kate Beauvais. Uh, Kim came to me last year and we started talking about um, Gullah Geechee, which she is very interested in and quite accomplished in doing now, and about taking pictures as a way of, look, of documenting the presence of a language in a community. This is called linguistic landscape. Analysis and of course I said, "A, well, who'd want to take pictures?" I didn't say that to her, but that's what I was thinking. Um, and then B, I'm not a good picture taker, so it, this wouldn't make sense to me. I, I'm going to have some pictures here that I've taken. I think they they help illustrate the points I'm going to be making a little bit. And then the second part, I'm going to be talking about language identity, uh, and this is work that Kate Bovey and I have been doing. Um, and again, most of the language identity part is stuff she did. So, in that sense, I'm I'm really just a proxy for the work she's done. <laughs> So this is the way the work, the talk will work. Um, I'm going to talk about Quechua, a little bit of socio-historical background of Quechua, talk about some linguistic-y things. So as, as Dylan pointed uh, out yesterday, I'm going to linguistic for a few minutes. Uh, I've tried to not linguistic as much as possible. And then I'm going to talk about regularization and normalization, a little bit of the language in, in the Quechua-speaking world, a little bit on a language identity, and some final remarks. It's just a quick overview of Quechua, Quechua, and I'll, and I'll mostly just refer to Quechua uh, because that's the variety I'll, I'll be talking about. There are, by some estimates, about 10 million speakers in the Andean region. So by, so, so by, by the standards that many of you have seen with other languages you've been talking about, this is not an endangered language, right? Um, is it a, a language that's going through a certain amount of attrition? There's no doubt about that. The, the numbers of monolinguals change every year, the number of bilinguals go up, and then the amount of just Spanish monolingualism also goes up quite regularly. In Peru alone, um, which is the place that I'll be mostly concentrating on, there are um, uh, about 3.5 million speakers in Peru. It's less than, um, sorry, that should be, it's less than we find, say, in a place like Bolivia. So these are the two, area, two countries in, in Latin America where you have the most Quechua speakers. Uh, it's less than you have in Bolivia, but it's still relatively high in the in the uh, in the Quechua-speaking world. 
Um, again, this is not a uh, talk about the origins of Quechua, but I want to say that in the Quechua world, um, as in many uh, language um, the politics of many language uh, communities, its origins are debated. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about the, uh, the Quechua Academy, and it is uh, vociferously dedicated to the idea that Cusco is the origin of Quechua. Uh, the data tell a completely different story, um, but uh, the, or I, I say they are debated. They're only really debated by in areas where the debate makes very little sense. It probably is the case that uh, it or, uh, had some origin on the coastal part of Peru, but that, that hypothesis is also a bit controversial. And there are a lot of regional varieties of Quechua. I don't need to say this. We had a really nice talk from, from Aaron yesterday about this, some of which are mutually unintelligible. Um, but uh, again, I'm not going to be getting into that too much. But I do want to say a little bit about the historical, some of the historical context of Quechua, only because I think it helps us understand a little bit about the current situation. Um, in, in the early days of, of European colonization, uh, it was an interesting phenomenon because when the Spaniards arrived, Quechua was a fairly recently domin or dominant language in the area. And what happened with colonization was it spread to places as far away as as Argentina and Colombia. So these are places where Quechua wasn't spoken before the arrival of the Europeans. So what we find nowadays with the extension of Quechua is really a function more of the, of the, of the European colonization more than what we found at the time of colonization. Um, in the, uh, the late 16th century, we find this uh, Council of Lima that promoted spoken Quechua as the, quote, language of eva evangelization, not only of the original Quechua-speaking population, but also of the people who were still in the process of becoming Quechua speakers at the time of the conquest. So at this point, Quechua is instituted as the, the lingua franca of, of European extension. Right, so, and, th and this was true, again, not just among populations who might have already spoken Quechua, but who didn't speak Quechua before and now are going to be speaking Quechua. That supplanted other languages that were there. But just like in most other Spanish colonies, the, the language policy in the area was, or, or among these, among uh, reg the, the Quechua speaking regions were, was largely assimilationist. Um, though Quechua, to this day, to some degree, still remains strong, particularly in remote areas. In fact. Nowadays, if you want to find large populations of monolingual speakers, the areas will be, if not remote, somewhat harder to get to than places like Cusco, for example, which is some of what I'm going to talk about. Um, there was a strict policy, in fact, later on, um, of what they call castellanización, uh, though some people did talk about linguistic diversity in some areas. So there were uh, some famous letters um, from an archbishop in Cusco in the, in the 18th century that talked about linguistic diversity in Cusco, where you had Quechua and Aymara and Pukina. These are all languages that would have been spoken by populations in that area. And he referred to, this archbishop referred to the, the um, Spanish policy of monolinguals, monolingualism as una, what is it, una repobable practica, right? So fairly strong language uh, from an archbishop to a king, uh, but you do hear these things. And then, again, just to Quickly going and moving forward in history, what we find is that in the 19th century, um, uh, instability, certain uh, certain amount of political and social and economic instability contributed to continuing attrition of Quechua-speaking communities. Later in the 20th century, uh, you f we find the establishment of programs for intercultural and bilingual education. These, this this term, this catch term, is still quite strong in the area, and you find I say catch term this this. Uh, this pattern is still quite strong in the area, and you find um, many, many different types of programs at all level of education targeted at teaching students and adults even um, to, to value indigenous language education or to start from the beginning teaching um, basic educational skills in, in, the, in this language, right? Um, but as Hornberger and Coronel Molina point out, uh, constitutional recognitions of language like this ha usually have very little impact on um, actual speaker numbers, right? Um, this is not just true in the Andean region. It's true in probably almost any of the situations that you guys can, can, can imagine. Now, um, I only have this one little slide here about the what in English some people call the High Academy of the Quechua Language, which I think is an awkward translation. Uh, the, the Quechua name is there listed on top, and then in Spanish it's called the Academia Mayor de la Lengua Quechua. 
Um, this was founded in, um, in the, I believe it was the 70s, with the idea of promoting Quechua language and culture. And as of 1998, it has a headquarters in Cusco. Establishment in this case often means by mandate of the government, which is really interesting because uh, the, the academy uh, will often try out these, these uh, official decrees of the government as ways of, of fortifying uh, observations about language policy. Right, so when they talk about a three vowel system versus a five vowel system, which is something we'll mention in a minute, um, they often do so with the backing or with the perceived backing of the government. That is, we've been <laughs> sanctioned by the government to make these decrees on behalf of all of the Quechua speaking peoples of the world. Um, and it's caused uh, quite a problematic, um, um, or quite a, a, a discussion among the community. So. Coronel Molina, uh, Molina points out that um, has had a largely, I'm going to get this word wrong, and I know it's going to bother Gary, uh, divisive, <laughs> I think that was the intentional wrong, uh, a largely divisive influence in the Quechua speaking community through the promulgation of, quote, elitist ideologies and policies. Now, uh, if you've ever had a chance to interact with the, uh, the, uh, um, the Academy of the Quechua Language, you'll know that elitist ideolog ideologies and policies is probably a good way to describe what goes on. Um, so we'll come back to this a little bit maybe, but I just want to point out that in terms of, in terms of looking at Quechua, um, this supposed bridge from Quechua as a spoken language among Quechua speaking communities and Quechua as a, as a language that might have some amount of normalization or officialization, um, this organization has, has, has played a, a suspicious role in that process. Okay. So I'm going to show you some pictures now. This is the stuff that, uh, that I wouldn't have probably done without, um, without Kim's. She didn't actually know I was going to do this, so uh, right. it wasn't suggested, so we'll see how it goes. Um, there, there's evidence of Quechua. So if you walk around places where there's Quechua spoken, you'll find that you're not, you don't just hear it, but you see Quechua. You see people writing Quechua, which is interesting because many of the monolingual speakers, in fact, most of them, wouldn't be able to read this. They wouldn't, they're, not, they're not going to read Quechua, right? So a lot of this is done for what, what purpose, right? Is it done for the purpose of, of instantiating some amount of indigenous language pride in the community? So the, so the question is why, why does this happen? But let, let's take a few looks, or a few uh, look at uh, these pictures. This, is, uh, this one's not very good. Again, this is attesting to my photographic skills. This is the Avenida del Sol in, in Cusco, and the, with the name translated below it. So Inti means sun, and Quichtiu means uh, street. So this is the Inti Quichtiu. Um, so a lot of the street names are translated into Quechua. A lot of the tr street names are are just Quechua names, right? So you find this this sort of passive introduction of Quechua in the community as a way of fortifying uh, Spanish nomenclature, right? Um, this is a an hospedaje, a, a lodging called the Coniwasi, which means hot house or warm house, right? So. Uh, if you want a warm house to stay, I'm pretty sure this is a this is a bargain one. So uh, if you want a warm house to stay, you might go to the on US. Um, it's probably cold. This is a, a uh, an artisanal bread store called Costco Maki. Costco Costco is the is the sort of uh, Quechuaized version of Cusco. Uh, it's the original. Also, one way to write it, Maki means hands or hand. And so you find this is the, the, the hands of Cusco bread store, right? Again, it's instantiating this idea that, that the language is, is available in the community, not just because of the speakers that speak it, but because people in the general community who, might not, who may not be speakers also have access to the language. Uh, this is near the, the uh, area of Santa Monica. It's called, uh, it's just a, a sign on the side of the road. It says, Cuna de los Ayus y Panacas Reales. So the cradle of the families and dy so dynasties should also be in red. Um, what's interesting here, aside from the fact that you have a mix of Spanish and Quechua, uh, and these are nouns, so you know, this is not exactly code switching, but uh, the Quechua words are pluralized with S, which is a, something I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, this is a very, or was, a really popular political campaign in Cusco. Um, this is the famous sort of um, uh, headwear you see in the area. Causachum Cusco is a, comes with the verb causai, it's a command, and it means que viva Cusco or live Cusco, right? 
Um, this was, a, again, a, a political movement, and these would be things you would see plastered around the city. Again, um, oft, again instantiating this idea of association between the local government and indigenous identity. Similarly, you find this at the national level. This is, a, this is something that was posted by the uh, Quechua Academy, actually, which I find really interesting because the one kid is wearing a Gap t-shirt. Um, uh, so, but you see the same idea, this idea that uh, we want to invoke at the same time that we're celebrating the uh, uh, Fiestas Patrias of Peru, we want to also invoke this notion of indigenous pride, and we say, Kausachum Peru. Now, the thing that you find among these examples is a lot of playfulness in terms of, of mixing of Spanish and Quechua. So this is a, this is a restaurant, Niña Chay. Niña, Niña is uh, Spanish for a little girl, in this case. Cha is the diminutive from Spanish, and then Y is the first person possessive. So this is a uh, sort of a blend of, of the Spanish root and some Quechua morphology, and you find this uh, in, in a lot of different cases. This is not an, the next one is not an example of that, but I, I love the example anyway. Hamui and try, which means <laughs> just come and try, right? So uh, they've given they've given up in this case of talking about Spanish and just jumped right into English. There are a lot of uh, English speaking tourists in the area, so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be surprising that um, uh, that you find something like this. But again, you see this this uh, intent on the part of the of the users in this case to to provide some evidence of the, or provide some indication of cultural association. Now, this is, this next was a little hard to see, but in, on the Avenue of Seoul, you have this long, this, this divider, and they've taken these dividers as a way of showing, uh, of, of uh, showing some artwork related to different uh, uh, issues of indigenous identity. And, and they say a lot of different things. This one says, Cosco Runa Cuna. And I've posted this one because um, the Runa Cuna in this case is more than likely going to be a symptom of the type of thing I'll get to in a minute, which is overuse of the pluralizer Cuna. You don't need Cuna here. Runa is, can also be interpreted as plural under certain conditions, and this could be one of those conditions. Um, but again, the point, the point of, the, of, the, of the display is not to, is not to um, is, is, is to invoke indigenous association, right? Not necessarily to invoke grammatical discussion about whether you need a pluralizer or not. Uh, that's for us to do, I guess. And then finally, uh, the one that I think really sparked all of this, this is a salon, um, as you can see. Uh, the word wadami means woman in Quechua. It is not pluralized with S in Quechua, but it is here, right? So uh, wadami is uh, woman, wadamis is women. Uh, so this is a nice lead into the structure that I'm going to get at. So Wadami would be one woman, or uh, doesn't have to be actually under the right under the right context. You get Wadami interpreted interpreted as many women, and then Wadamis would definitely be this the, this uh, contact version of adopting the Spanish S and making Wadami plural, which is what we're going to talk about now. So this is the sort of thing that prompted um, the 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 work that I'm going to present now. Now, in, uh, in, the, in, this, in Spanish Quechua contact in the area, and, and Aaron can talk a lot more about this than I do, there's a lot of different th types of effects we can talk about. We can talk about phono uh, phonetics, uh, phonological effects or issues of phonological contact. I'm not going to go over these because um, I, Aaron did a perfect job with that yesterday. But just to point out that things like, as Aaron pointed out yesterday, motosidad, this, this, this notion of the, the, the alternation between high and mid vowels is, is highly uh, prevalent, at least as a, as a sociolinguistic marker among speakers in the community. So much so that, um, that you'll find people using, using these terms as a, way of, uh, as a way of making fun of speakers who may or may not have proficiency in Spanish or have a different, or, or, or maybe Quechua speaker. So this is definitely a mark of sociolinguistic identity in the area. And then you have some other cases here. Again, we won't go into these too much. Um, there's a lot of syntactic uh, borrowing here. We have um, omission of direct object pronouns. You have increased SOV order. Spanish, for the most part, is an, is an SVO language. Uh, Quechua is most definitely an OV language. Um, again, with, with also a certain amount of, of word order flexibility. But you do get, in Spanish, a certain amount of change in to SOV word order, which is a illicit word order in, in Spanish. And you get some morphosyntax, which is more of the types of things that I've worked on. Uh, you get increase of the use of paraphrastic paths. You get 
Uh, I say use or overuse of the diminutive in Spanish uh, or borrowing from the Quechua diminutive with cha. You get what some people would call overuse of the Spanish progressive. So these types of verbs that you wouldn't think would e easily progressivize, they do in, in this area of, uh, of, um, of, of the Spanish speaking world. And then other things like nomás, so you, if you take a cab, you can say, déjame aquisito nomás, right? So just, just here, right? Um, so this is fairly, fairly common to hear. And again, these aren't things that I'll get into, but I just, as a way of prefacing the, the, the effect I'm gonna talk about. And again, enough people have talked about language contact thus far, they don't have to go too far into this, but we have a lot of different types of contact-induced language shift. We can talk about long words, we can talk about code switching, and we can talk about morphological borrowing. There's a famous uh, Meyer Scotten observation about morphine borrowing, which uh, actually makes the case that borrowing certain morphological borrowing morphologically can be can be problematic. Uh, that is, in many in many cases, she actually argues that it doesn't happen. I think there's been enough work since 1993 to suggest that it's not exactly as easy as as this uh, um, claim makes. In fact, the free the um, the bound morphine constraint, or was it? is a bound morphine constraint, would actually suggest that you couldn't get bound morphology born or uh, borrowed across languages. And that, again, we've we found enough evidence since then to suggest that it's, it, if, if that's true, it's not at least on the face of it is true, and true in the way that Meyer Scotten had, uh, had discussed it. Um, so what, we, what we're gonna see in the next part here is really related more to this type of, uh, of code switching or borrowing we might call, which this is from English L, um, code switching that's described by Almazu 2009. This is work that, that Kate was largely responsible for putting together, where you have uh, English and plural morpheme S and the U, U por, uh, plural morpheme W, I think that's how it's pronounced, um, being used as plural elements in, in speech. Uh, you have cases where the English plural morpheme does not appear, but the but the U plural morpheme is added, um, and then you have the you have the opposite case. So you have a lot of uh, of, of um, variation in this case in terms of what strategies bilinguals use for marking plurality. Um, now, for again, any of those who you, who have worked on or have talked about languages that might have systems uh, um, that have multiple plurals might have also observed the fact that many of these languages, especially when you have contact situations, those, those systems can reduce, right? So um, if you have a language that has multiple ways, multiple morphological categories for marking, um, um, for marking plurality distinctions or number distinctions, what you find in many cases, especially in cases where there's language attrition, is that those categories can reduce, not just plural, Mark, uh, categories of plural marking, but categories of that have multiple morphological instantiations in general. Um, that's not exactly what we're talking about here, but the, um, that is it, that um, it is definitely the case with other languages spoken in um, Central and South America. Now, I don't probably need to tell you, though I think it's worth pointing out that uh, plural marking in Spanish is a lot like plural marking in English, right? So we have we have words that end in vowels; uh, those get an s. Words that end in consonant, they get an es. What's important to note quickly about uh, Spanish plurality is that it's it's a if it's, it's a syntactic thing as well, right? So we need to know about nominal number to, to get things like adjective agreements, so las, uh, la casa roja, las casas rojas, or um, verbal agreement, right? La casa es grande, las casas son grandes. Well, Quechua plurality is a little different. Um, I'll give you just an idea about how it's similar. So we have, we can take a word like bruna and we can create bruna cuna, which presumably pr produces people. We can take a word like michi and mi put, make michi cuna. Um, Adelar observes that almost virtually all dialects of Quechua share, share this pluralization of nouns and nominalized verbs by means of the suffix cuna, though pluralization does not apply to all plural entities. So this is an important comment, I don't think that he means it as a caveat, but I think it is that plurality in Quechua is not necessarily a the, the same sort of morphosyntactic category that we have in English. In fact, it, de it most definitely isn't. And we see that in a case like this. So, uh, for example, um, we don't have, we don't use uh, plurality, we don't mark adjectives for plurality. This is also not strange across linguistically, so it's not, you know, it's not necessarily out, out here. So we say, Sumat ika, which is a beautiful flower, or sumat ika kuna, which is beautiful flowers. The adjective doesn't pluralize. 
We might have, for example, a plural noun and a plural verb. This is the type of thing you would expect to have in Spanish. Um, so the women come. But we might also have a singular noun and a plural verb. So cari, cari is singular. Kashanku is plural. The men are in the house. We have a singular noun and a plural verb. Uh, that is, there's, no, there's not necessarily subject-verb agreement in the way that we think of subject-verb of agreement in Spanish. And this is important from the from the normalized from the sort of prescriptive perspective because what's what I'm going to what I think we're going to show you happens is that the perception is that the system is like Spanish therefore when we start telling people how they should write quechua we start over generalizing plurals which is what essentially we which is what we think is happening um, and then you have you can have a plural noun and a singular verb so runa kuna kusikun right the people are happy right all these things are possible and suggest that um, that plurality of Quechua, again, is not, is not the same type of system in, uh, that you have in Spanish. And again, this is not a groundbreaking observation. It's really not even my observation. It's just an observation that the two systems are different. However, the morphological simplicity of taking a verb and adding cuna seems to lend itself to comparing it to Spanish S. And that's, that's where I think the, the problem is. And there are a lot of other uh, ways to mark plurality in Quechua. For example, we might use a quantifier like Ashka. We might have uh, cardinal numbers. We might have reduplication. So such as a tree, a such a such a is a, is a forest. Uh, we might have other suffixes that mark uh, sort of collectivity or reciprocity or distributivity. Um, so Quechua number gets marked in a lot of different ways other than just by this morphological cases. And there are some cases that we call, that we, that we refer to as herent doubles. This is, this is not a, this is not, an, uh, a, again, a category that's specific to Quechua. So we have some, some elements that just are, are uh, inherently uh, plural, like eyes, for example. So nyawi almost never pluralize body parts, especially ones that come in pairs, right? Okay, um, there's a lot of variation. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. I don't wanna take um, too much time here. Uh, According to Howard, and this is a textbook, um, the pluralization of nouns is not an inherent category of Quechua grammar. In fact, she's one of the only people I've ever heard actually say this. Um, and it's interesting because it's in a textbook. Uh, it should be somewhere, I think, where linguists might pay more attention to it. So papa, for example, might refer to a potato or potatoes, right? So, and I think this is an important comment because it gets to this idea of this perceived structural similarity. Um, she also points out that this variation in plural marking isn't necessarily, it varies pretty widely across dialects. In fact, in some cases, you just get the plural from Spanish borrowed into Quechua. So you might get mayus for the plural of mayu, or awakuna um, as the plural of awai, or awa, excuse me. Um, and then sometimes you get both of them. So these are the really fun examples. And these were the examples that I actually would have liked to have worked on. It's just hard to find examples of these types. So you, in so many cases, you get both. Uh, so these are the second set of examples here. So ishkai moraskunata. So this is two blackberries. So this is both, this is both the Spanish, and the uh, the Quechua plural or chai cosas kuna manta. So cosas kuna. Now, what's been argued about these cases of spe of double plurals is that they only happen with loan words. So these are elements that are probably, or at least some argument argue, that are borrowed in as plural, and then repluralized in Quechua. Uh, that probably isn't the case. Uh, we found some data that would suggest that this isn't the case. Again, they're not robust data, but we've, we've um, found some things like that. Um, okay, let me skip over that real quick. Now, this, so in, in a, a kind of a, sh just a short grammatical, now this is sort of a, a manual on proper Quechua. This is by uh, Aguilar Gomez. He lays out some of the rules for making, for the rules for a lot of things. So this is basically best practice in writing Quechua. This is from a Bolivian perspective. Um, so he observes that Wadami should be pluralized as Wadami Kuna. That's fine. Um, for, for, and perhaps the mo my, my, my most favorite quote out of all the things I've read is this quote, and the whole thing's in Quechua. But the last thing, he basically says, some Spanish-speaking people, uh, people speak borrowing the plural marker S, and some people have learned to add them both to the root. And the last thing he says, So this is not good. <laughs> so, uh, uh, which is not really a, a, an aggressively uh, harsh way of saying don't do this or this is wrong, but it still gets to the point that this is something that people see as, as improper speech. Now, 
we think that there's a lot of over pluralization going on and let me give you two really quick samples of, way of, of cases where we think this happens. So we think that uh, we found cases where Kuna is used with cardinal numbers. This would be something that in monolingual Quechua you wouldn't normally get. That is, plural, cardinal numbers don't necessarily provoke plurality on a noun. So you have ishkai michi, or huk michi, one cat, ishkai michi, two cats, right? Again, not something strange across languages. Um, but it does happen in, in what we would consider normalized documents for Quechua, right? And then finally, uh, secondly, Kuna with quantifier Ashka. So just to give you a few, there aren't, there, we don't have too many examples here. And the data that I have from interview data in, in Cusco doesn't show this a lot either. Most of the data that I have though are with uh, high, dominant Quechua speakers. Uh, they don't do this a lot, at least the ones that I have. So for example, this is a translation from a, a blog again you got to be suspicious about blocks sometimes, but in La Casa Hubo Dos Perros, this is the, this is the Spanish translation, the original is in English, or is, or is in Quechua. Wasipi Casca Ishkai Alco Cuna, this is uh, two dogs with the plural marker, right? Again, this is, this is a document that we found online, that we find online, these types of cases, so the question is, well, what's the, what's the effect? If the person is writing in Quechua online for a general audience who can read, well, maybe this is something that's been subject to the types of normalization processes we think produce over pluralization. Um, the, the Bible translations, which is, there are a lot of Bible translations, as you probably know, are full of these things, right? So they're often subject to some normalizing body, and that's what happens in these cases, right? So here we have, uh, there were four men on the highway, two at the court, and we have Tawa Runa Kuna, Ishkai Runa Kuna. Again, not cases in monolingual Quechua where you would get pluralization on, on, the, on the noun. Um, and of course, uh, Twitter, which again is the font of all things cool nowadays. Uh, you have Kinsa Warmakuna, which is for women. So this is, this, is a, this is a use that you find in lots of different cases. Um, this, one, <laughs> this one is only me poking fun at other centers for Latin American Caribbean studies because I think ours is the best one. Um, <laughs> But at NYU, this is their public blog, and they wrote Ishkai Wainu uh, Chakuna. Uh, so, uh, so we need to um, encourage encourage less adherence to these faux prescriptive norms. Okay, uh, the second case that we found are cases with Ashka. So in English, this is a case that would be translated as many women. So we have Chiwi Ashka Warmikuna, again pluralization as a result of the as a result of the uh, of Ashka. Um, and then just w one other example here, really quickly. Um, look, many people are coming from the tops of the mountains. Again, this is from the Bible translation, Ashkaruna uh, Kuna. Again, just a few cherry-picked examples, just to show you that among the case, among those of, of those of those types of of vehicles that might be subject to prescriptive pressure, we find what we believe are cases of over pluralization. Now. The question might be, well, what does this have to do with linguistic identity at all? Um, I'm not sure if you were asking yourself that question, but I did bring this up before. Uh, we do think it has something to do with linguistic identity. Um, now, I just want to mention really quickly, and this is something Kate really uh, uh, worked on quite a bit, uh, was this notion of media lengua. Uh, this is sometimes the, the word that, or the term that's used to refer to mixed Quechua Spanish uh, spoken in Ecuador. It's sometimes also referred to as chao pisimi, chao pilengua, chao piquichua, quichuñol, right? These are all pejorative terms for the most part, though it depends on, the, again, like a lot of these things, it depends on, on uh, the person making the reference and the person receiving the reference. Uh, it utilizes Spanish lexicon and Quechua syntax, morphosyntax, uh, morphology and syntax, and a large amount of variation in morphology. Uh, so if you've ever read anything that uh, comes from this variety of, of language, it's really, really fascinating. Um, and it regularly incorporates things from Spanish, um, um, both from Spanish and, and Quechua. Now, one of the things, uh, one of the things we've noticed is that in, um, investigators have found negative connotation associated with mixed forms of language, right? So Stewart uh, recommended that, um, that speaker, that researchers not even use this term, these terms, that they, they avoid some terms, avoid terms like media lengua altogether. Um, 
Shapek, 2011, concluded that there were several sociolinguistic groups, including men, younger speakers, and more educated speakers, and those that had previously migrated from other areas that were more likely to favor uh, use of a more quote-unquote pure Quechua, right? Um, again, going back to this idea that there's a perceived pure Quechua. Now, what, what many people perceive by pure Quechua is not necess is avoiding use of a Spanish S, not avoiding use of over-pluralizing the cuna. Right, so there's a, there's, a, there's a difference that we might look at. I mean, it's subtle from the outsider's perspective. From our perspective, I think it's quite striking. Um, the overall perspective for media language, at least according to these studies, especially the Shapek study, is, uh, is quite negative among speakers, that it's not, a, that it's not pure Quechua. Um, however, when speakers were asked how to say words that had been borrowed from Spanish to Quechua, most uh, knew how to translate individual words, right? Negative attitudes associated with this mix, mix of languages is projected onto the speech and not to the, to the speech act, uh, according to Shapek, and not to the speaker necessarily. Um, and because, again, this is an observation from Shapek, because of the lack of metalinguistic knowledge and negative association with the speech act and not the individual, it's difficult for media linguist speakers to identify who speaks pure Quechua. Right. Now, there are other studies that, that look at this, that this look at this sort of reverse borrowing. For example, we find with Tamil speakers in southern India that uh, um, ta uh, Tamil words replace previously borrowed Hindi words in order to preserve and maintain identity. This is something Meyer Scott has talked about. Col uh, Collins, 2005, worked with mom bilinguals in Guatem uh, Guatemala, many of whom typically code switch to Spanish. Uh, and they do this in, in, as a way of marking prestige in Guatemala. But mom teachers believe that code switching is a, quote, slap in the face to the mom language, right? This is, this is also the case that you find, or it's similar to wording that you might find with the Quechua Academy, that is, why use a, a Spanish word when we have perfectly reasonable Quechua words? In fact, uh, I should have brought my, my manual that, uh, that's produced by the Quechua Academy. They go to great lengths to translate things into Quechua. Um, and some of these terms are, they exist, but they're, pra they're practically non-existent in the, in the community. These would be terms, for example, like the days of the week. No one that I have ever heard who speaks Quechua uses the Quechua days of the week. I don't, there, maybe there are remote areas where they don't, but um, uh, it is quite common to find the Spanish words borrowed into Quechua for the days of the week. Um, Collins concludes, however, that uh, educated teachers see the value of mom language, um, uh, but increased value would need to come from the community as a whole, right? So the community recognition that, okay, it's important that we, that we maintain use of this language and that we create environments, uh, formal environments, in which uh, speakers can exchange information using this language. Um, and then finally, again, this is, this is for any of you who are interested in uh, minority languages, um, just that in a context where there's a dominant language, that the value of both the dominant language and the minority language be recognized. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. Yeah, okay. Um, this model has been around for a while. I don't really want to say too much uh, about it, but I do want to, to uh, point out that... Um, uh, this, this push is not without a certain amount of socio-historic background, right? So when you encourage speakers to use more Quechua words where they could use non-Quechua words, um, the, the idea here, at least the, the underpinning, is that you're empowering use of the Quechua language, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily recognize what I've, what I've observed as a sort of hybridization of, of the language used, not hybridization in the simple borrowing sense, but hybridization in the sense that the language environments themselves in urban areas especially have become hybrid among Spanish and Quechua. Um, but this push for pure Quechua seems to create a new group identity for Quechua speakers, One's where, one that, where, that produces a certain amount of avoidance of code switching, um, and this perception that somehow um, that maintaining um, a pure Quechua um, Makes makes Quechua more likely to prevail in the end, at least in terms of numbers and speakers and robustness. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to skip over this part. Okay, um, but it's important to point out, I I think, um, and this is something again uh, going back to the point that I made earlier about students that students has helped me see as well that a connection to pure pure identity doesn't necessarily 
mean avoiding your bicultural identity. This is something that uh, we've seen in some presentations before. We see this played out in every area of the world where there's more than one language spoken. Um, for example, Spanish, English, biculturals in the United States. Uh, identity becomes intertwined between the two cultures. So we don't necessarily talk about cultures, people in these cages having uh, belonging to do different cultures, but being bicultural in the sense that uh, their cultures are blended in some way. Um, so what does this mean for identity? And um, so it, it means that it, we rely heavily on this notion of biculturalism and that index, indexing mixed language as a slap in the face to Quechua would, would actually ostracize the community that might find that this is the way of expressing bicultural identity. Again, I haven't said anything here about pluralization specifically, but I think it fits all under this notion of, of what Shopek and others have talked about as language mixing and code mixing. Um, so again, I'm not going to go back to pluralization that much, or really at all now, but, um, but I think that's where it fits in here. Okay, so just some, some preliminary conclusions here, well, conclusions. Uh, columns. We think that media language, or looking at something like media language, demonstrates the duality of present day Quechua identity. Duality in the sense that we have this very strong uh, push, governmental push, societal push um, for maintenance of indigenous identity. Um, and it produces this personal conflict in many cases uh, for speakers. And for, for a case like Collins, for example, he observes that, well, in these cases, it's important that a community come together and value the language. This is exactly, this is exactly what, was, what Dylan talked about yesterday. That is, language preservation, language maintenance doesn't happen without community involvement, right? So uh, if, we, if we have a set of students here who are interested in studying a language that only has five speakers left in the world, there's a good chance that despite our best efforts, we won't be able to produce a thriving first language community of that language. Right? That's not to say you shouldn't try, it just means that it might be an uphill battle. So community, language uh, preservation or language, really maintenance of language use really does require community. Um, the use of, and again going back to this use of borrowing, the use of reverse borrowing of Spanish loan words can have power to redesignate prestige to the Quechua speakers, at least that's been the claim. Um, Quechua speakers, however, must be careful not to devalue their biculturalism through negative indexing of mixed languages like media lengua. Again, so what, a lot of what we see about that, that we think produces over things, effects like over pluralization, we think are reactions to, reactions to, to uh, the types of trends that produce a, a code like media lengua. That is, when you mix Spanish and English or Spanish and Quechua all together, what you get is this mix that seems to suggest that you're not a speaker of either. So the response to that is to encourage a use of Quechua that, that is highly stylistic, A, for one, and B, really doesn't reflect what we know to be the case, and linguists to be the case about Quechua. That is in terms of this one specific case. Uh, so finally, just some summary real quick. Uh, from a strictly structural perspective, I think we do, it, it's a no-brainer that we can show that there's a lot of structural transfer here with different degrees of structural of, of convergence. This is not really a point that I've made here, but a point that Aaron made yesterday and that people have made. Um, I, yeah, so. Uh, some of these features, such as plural marking, have been identified as divergent from pure Quechua. We believe that, um, that there's, a, there's a pattern of over-normalization going on here with, uh, with plurals and with other types of uh, morphological marking as well. Um, and we think, or we can observe here, that speaker's sense of language identity is influenced by things like community ex ex external <laughs> pressures and then ex community internal pressures. Right? Both of these pressures are at play at the same time um, and shape uh, a speaker's linguistic identity. So what's happening now with this project in general? So this is not just the project I'm working on, but um, this is the project Kate and I have been working on, and then that Bethany is working on, Sarah is working on. So all, these are all things that people are in the works and doing. Um, we're working on developing some sociolinguistic interview data that, that we can use to look at some of these structural things. That is, this is the part where we linguistic. Um, and we would like to pull out forms and see where we get, where we get cases of kuna, what their overall rates of usage of kuna are. Can we determine good measures for determining what counts as an overusage of kuna. I think we have some measures now, but we don't really have a robust set of tools to look at those things yet. Um, and more importantly, I think, in the part that without student involvement, I, I would have, as, as someone who's 
primarily interested in structural variation and looking at the ways that, that languages shift from point A to point B in terms of time. Um, looking at speakers' attitude with, with these types of overgeneralizations, that is, do speakers actually have attitudes about these things? And if, and if so, and many times th there, some of the distinctions are subtle, so we might not see them. Um, if they do have attitudes or they have opinions about these things, what are they and how do they relate to these patterns that we've just observed? Um, I think that's it. So thank you. And any questions? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm fascinated by this. Uh, so um, I really am interested in this idea that the kind of authorities for the Quechua language, the academy, are promoting a usage of Quechua that is not really pure Quechua. Anymore, <laughs> right? This overgeneralization of the plural. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing maybe it has something to do with the idea, you know, it is an influence of Spanish, the idea that Oh, you know, catch what Spanish regularly marks the plural, and for us to be a good yes. language that is grammatically correct, it needs to have regular plural marking. And yeah. Sometimes it needs to always be good again. Is the, there any recognition among Quechua authorities that this is some kind of false grammar rule that they're introducing into the language, or are they um, totally oblivious to this idea? In as much as, in as, much as I consider myself a grammar person in Quechua, which I don't, um, I would say no, right? I, I don't think there's a lot of, rec I don't think there's a lot of, there's a lot of meta reflection on the academy as having a, a positive or a detrimental effect on, on language policy in Quechua. There's, a, there's some discussion on that. One has to be exceedingly careful when you talk about the academy because A, sometimes they're listening, and B, uh, it's not always clear, again, if you want to do research in the area, if you have someone who's affiliated with the academy, if they know you're not aligned with their perspective, then your possibilities of doing research can be difficult. This is largely Peru. I don't think they have as much influence outside of Peru. Um, uh, but I don't think there's, all, there's not a lot of reflection on the actual linguistic observations that they make. For the most part, the people who make up the academy aren't linguists, for the most part. There are some people who are trained linguists, and Aaron, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there are some people who are trained linguists, uh, but for the most part, they're not linguists. Again, that doesn't make you, that doesn't make you a worse monitor of the language. It, it does mean that in these questions of, of linguistic borrowing that sometimes the observation can be a bit ad hoc. For, just to give you another example, the verbal system in, in Ketch was pretty, I, I think, pretty easy actually compared to Spanish. Uh, Spanish, and like many Romance languages, has morphological classes. You have first, second, third class, right? There are no morphological classes in Quechua. Routinely in textbooks, especially ones that align to certain, to certain paradigms, you will find authors categorizing Quechua verbs based on the, what vowel they end in. This is a completely, a completely invented category in Quechua. So you have UI verbs and you have IY verbs and you have AY verbs. There's no, there's no reason to separate any of them. Uh, in fact, arguably you could make the case that there's no reason to present Quechua verbs as ending in IY or AY at all. It's just that we do by convention. Um, because that, you know, the Y is not an infinitive form per se. It kind of works like an infinitive. It's more of a, a nominalized verb. Uh, but these are these are the effects that we have. So I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm trained in Spanish grammar. My job is to teach you Quechua grammar. So surely, if in Spanish we pluralize an s by or a word by adding an s, in Quechua you pluralize by adding cun. I think that's the that's what's going on. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of linguistic insecurity, isn't it? So, in a way. But I've got a yeah. comment to question, Chad. Hang on. So, so isn't it curious though how often we see that? There's this idea that, that code switching and language mixing, as you were talking about, sort of attacks or undermines the identity of the language. Where, where, when ironically, code switching is a really powerful group marker, right? and, it, and it, it, it serves to identify a particular group. That's I right. Hardly when I it was a talk yesterday about the woman who sat down and decided she was going to code switch to get code switching. And I remember when I was a, That's right. in grad school, I, I decided I was going to do a thing on code switching. I just got back from Spain. And Really good because so yeah, I said I sat down with these people expecting to get all kinds of code switching, and I got zero, right. obviously, because I, I wasn't part of the group. But the question too is, so you've got examples like Niña Chai, yeah, and, and 
and, and I think you might have mentioned in passing with bird morphology, you maybe you don't see this, but you see something like that where you learn that in in coach switching you don't get mix mixing of morphemes. Like that's the right? claim. That is well, that's been the claim for. That's what's striking. Yeah, so you like you don't get things like I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm combing right from for comed to eat and ing from English right. You don't get people doing that. That's for the most part true, that you don't get that particular case. But is the bowel morpheme constraint a real thing in general? I, the in general sense, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem to be on the face of it. Uh, and there might be ways of teasing apart different morphemes that we want to talk about in terms of our typology of morphemes that can borrow. And I, I think a more rigorous approach would have to take that into account, but... Uh, Has Nina been taken into Quechua as a, as a prestamo, as a, as a borrowed term from Spanish, so that you can say at this point that it's part of the That's lexicon. part of the lexicon. Like, Niña, child, you can say that. So that's a good question. Um, so in Quechua, you always have to be careful because there are so many things that get borrowed that the status of any particular borrowing is, 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 can be debated, right? Um, so the status of a borrowing like um, like escuela, for example, for school is that's pretty. That's a pretty well established in some varieties of Quechua. In other varieties, it's not. Um, Nina, I, I mean, I, w I I would say no. Nina is not a particularly robust borrowing, but again, at least at least in the in the in the dialects or the data that I have. Um, so, I, I think this was just the store owner being playful, which, again. It's it's fine, but from our perspective, the the effect is the the effect is to produce this this feeling of biculturalness, right? You know, whether it works for the tourists who pass by here, who would presumably buy the food here, I don't know. I'm guessing they don't get it, but that's I don't know. Kim. Well, first of all, I really enjoyed your presentation, and thank you for your kind words. Um, and um, you know how I like to get down to the moon beans. And I think you also know that I'm doing the Tutuvi uh, field methods class this semester. And so you mentioned that the days of the week are pretty universally the Spanish ones yeah. um, in Quechua. Um, can you tell me, um, you know, we found out that the, the calendar in Tutuvi is based on the Mayan calendar, you know, 13 months and the kind yeah. of 20 month numerical uh, iteration cycle. Um, is that the same? in? Quechua, or do they use the regular 12-month calendar? Um, are, are you familiar with how that works? So the Quechua, the, the Incan calendar is a little different. I, I'm, I'm not going to go out on limb and really tell you that I know exactly how it works, because I don't. Okay. Um, but uh, it's it's an agrarian calendar, again, like many of the groups of the, of the, of, of the area. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I know. Well, and the quick follow-up, um, you mentioned, I know you had a couple of slides that had um, like two, two women or two men or whatever mm -hmm. with the, the Quechua counting terms. Um, and we know from Tutuhil that most people use the numbers one through five oh. um, is the Quechua term. I mean, yeah. it's the Tutuhil term. And then and they, they switch to Quechua. Switch or, to Spanish. Yeah. Um, do they count? Do they have counting words? Yeah, so Quechua has a, in fact, one of the first things that you learn in Quechua is your numbers and then to remind yourself, which I think they're all using it for the and they like to boast this idea that there's a there's a word for billion. Do you remember what it is? So they there are these words in Quechua. There's a word for thousand. There's a word for million. There's a word for billion. Why not? English has them. Why wouldn't we have them, right? Um, it, I don't know how often you use the word billion in Quechua unless uh, unless you're talking about. So there are a lot of news reports that are done in Quechua, and you're talking about maybe government issues and government expenditures or business expenditures or whatever. You might use the word billion, but there is a word. And so there, there are, there's a discrete number system just like similar to what we have in, in English, for example. Now, you're, the, qu the other question you're talking about, though, is do, do speakers, what level of dominance do speakers have of the number system? Yes. Uh, on any, with any given speaker, depending on their level of bilingualism, you will find mixes of Spanish and, uh, Spanish and Quechua numbers. Um, with largely dominant Quechua dominance, you'll get mostly Quechua numbers. Uh, though we've run into, for example, uh, I was in a market once and we were talking to this child and he started counting back to us some change and it, he was speaking to us in Quechua, but when he counted back to us, it was all in Spanish. Interesting. So sometimes, and that might be a reflection of the education system. Yes, I was just going to say. Right. So it might be perceived that math is something that's important enough you should do in Spanish. Interesting. Right. Again, I, I'm speculating a little, but that's what I, that's what I think would be the source of that.
Eric? Lots of ideas. I'm probably going to uh, limit them uh, to a few. Uh, the idea of the pluralization uh, that um, uh, everything that you presented, I was, uh, I was going, oh yes, that, that makes sense. The, um, so if you pluralize, or, or if you if you put a number before a noun to express plurality, like uh, if you say, and I'm going to go back to chicken. <laughs> so for Cusco Quecha, Walpa. Walpa. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have Ishki Walpa, mm -hmm. then that already tells you that you have two That's chickens. Right. But I think you could have some sort of pluralization, but with a different meaning. So if you have two different types, Ishki right. Walpa Una, mm -hmm. if you showed two pictures of the exact same colored chicken with mm -hmm. the exact same type of spots, you might get Ishki Walpa. Mm -hmm. But if you showed a picture of one chicken that was white and one chicken that was like uh, a cheap chi chicken that mm -hmm. was like a black and white spotted, right. then you might get an Ishiki Wapakuna. No, I, it, so, that I, in fact, the original version, the original title of the talk was meant to talk about things exactly like that, which is to say that the pluralization, I was going to talk more about what I think are some of the semantic properties of, of the plural marker of the kunai and, and Quechua, and I think that that was exactly the type of marking, that it's not a question of just simple morphosyntactic number, but, but, the, but the, and then once I put it in, I figured, you know what, I don't have this fleshed out well enough, so I'm going to leave that out. But the point is well taken, which is that even, even if that's the case, right, if that's what Kuna does, which is different from Spanish as, the point is it's different. And when it's being reintroduced to speakers as a way of normalizing their Quechua, it's being done so with a way that makes reference to Spanish, not with reference to the way Quechua is done. So it gets back to the issues that Dylan was pointing out yesterday, that is, if you're going to teach tone, might as well do it in a way that fits with what we know actually about tone, right? Uh, and so that, that would be a point. It's subtle to say, well, it's not just about having one chicken versus more than one chicken. It's about groups of chickens. <laughs> and so this gets you into issues of like distributed t dig uh, distributing uh, properties across individuals. And I, I think that's what's happening with Kuna. And you're, I think you're exactly right. Kuna doesn't create chicken chickens. It creates chicken groups of chickens. I totally agree. But, but either way, the point is lost on uh, in the process of feeding back into Quechua, feeding back into normalization processes. Yeah. Hopefully that addresses what you were talking about. No, definitely. Yeah. So. Well, parallel to that, I, I think that's probably likely. If you yeah. have a parallel in English, it's fish versus fishes. That's right, exactly. There are 100 fish in the, in the, you know, in the lake, but uh, I know of three types of fishes. That's right. Yeah, three, three fishes, et cetera, that you're talking about different species That's right. of fish and so on. That's exactly right. I, I would suggest that if you look into that, you probably find that to be That's right. And in fact, this does happen in English. So um, it, now it, it, it's the, the prescription is a bit different in English, but uh, children want to r regularize these things. So you get things like fishes using, being, being used to describe more than one fish instead of groups of fish. And then, of course, your teacher corrects you and says you can't do that. And, um, so, don't. This is really fun. <laughs> the world that, well, they make you think, of course, I'm not used to thinking about this stuff. And there's the two things that confuse me in English about plural. And I'm wondering if you can relate them at all to this or if it's just a totally different thing. My English is not great, so you can do <laughs> it. So in English, so you can say something like, a record number of companies has been formed, or a record number of companies have been formed. And it's like, what are you agreeing with? The number of companies, or it's a record, the head now of the, the thing. Is this at all related to that? So. <laughs> and there's another part of it. This is, again, I think maybe a British English American. Yeah. Thing. If we talk about the team has arrived, then they talk about the team have arrived. Right. And it seems like there's more of a semantic notion yeah. coming into play with plurality in these cases, where there's a semantic syntax yeah. mismatch. Is that? Well, it's funny you should mention that. What's going on there? Yeah. It doesn't relate necessarily to what I was talking about here. If most of the rest of my research deals with exactly that question. <laughs> and, uh, and it's somewhat in English, so right, you find these plural mismatches all over the place, and not just English, but in a lot of languages, and especially in these what we call binomial compounds, like uh, you said, what was the first example? A record number. A record number of, right? So for example, um, 
with quantifiers like uh, lots of, for example, lots of is not so good, but um, uh, a, 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 a ton of, right? A ton of, a ton of cars are in the parking lot, right? So that almost always defaults to the second noun, right? With a lot of actually, I don't know, I've tested this on lots of people, and as far as I know, you cannot agree with lot and lots of, right? So you can't say a lot of, a, lo uh, a, lot, of, a lot of dogs is in the yard, right? So that, that expression is so grammaticalized that it's just opaque to the semorpho syntax at that point. What you're looking at uh, um, is interesting because speakers do vary, and they vary quite a bit. And it depends, at least in the research that I've done, on the level of fix fixedness of the quantifying expression. Right? It also depends on the nature of the quantification, right? Is it distributive quantification? Is it general? I mean, it depends on the type of quantification you're looking at. Um, but I, I totally, the, the, one of the things we don't understand really well, I think, about pluralization is we understand that in languages that have plural marking that when this thing pluralizes, this thing should too, right? When it doesn't, we need to explain why. But there are all of these other layers of discourse meaning that end up to contributing to pluralization that I, I don't think uh, that picture tells, that, that story tells us anything about. That is exactly the point, right? That, uh, and, and Quechua, in as much as that relates to Quechua, and the point that, say, Aaron was making, I think there's a, there's a lot of contextual factors that feed into do we get plural nouns, do we get plural verbs, um, that, aren't, that aren't per se morphosyntactic. And the, the, in, in Spanish, the expectation is that things that are plural take plural agreeers and all, it's very fixed, and Catalan, you would know that it's all very set. Um, and there, there's some variation in, in Spanish and Catalan as well, but um, in, in Quechua, that's just not the case. And I'm assuming, Cherokee, and as much as I know about Cherokee, which is nothing, uh, that number is probably less obvious than one would imagine, too. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Can I ask what more than about the plural is S? Yeah, the choice between S and Kuna. And S can only show up following the vowel, is that right? And then you get Kuna following the consonants. Yes, that's, yes. And, and those varieties where you borrow Spanish S, the claim has been there's an alternation. Uh, so you would either get S or Cuna or Scuna. Now, I haven't found any data yet. Scuna, all right, you get double. And I haven't found data yet, and Kate, you can correct me if I'm wrong, where, you, where, the, Spanish, where the Spanish plural comes after, where so you get Cunas. I believe that's probably because I haven't looked hard enough. In fact, I could probably just Google one now. But Cuna, where, so where you get, so the argument has been made that if you borrow an S, it's almost always that if you borrow S, it's almost always with a loan word. That's not true necessarily. Um, the, our question has been, well, do you also get S scoping outside of Kuna? So you get Watami, Watami Kuna, Watamis, or Watami Kunas. My suspicion is that you do get that, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. No, just to follow that, just very quick, that might be a complex with the evidence that you system. That's right. So that's the other piece of this. There's an evidential system in Quechua that, that tells something about source of, uh, of information. And one of the allomorphs is C or S, right? And so uh, you, you, could, you could, in that case, come in conflict with the evidential system. That's right. <laughs> exactly. What syllable code is allowed? Syllable code is allowed in Quechua. Uh, S, uh, there's some fricatives. No, not in Quechua. Not so, that I know of. So could, could someone do like uh, instant IE and say, look, you could S at the end of the vowel, that's what I'm calling, but you have to use the other one because you can't get constant S. That's why we have to be way too much of Right. Uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. Probably. I'd have to think about that a little bit, yeah. Um, we'll go ahead and stop here. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll give Kate a chance to set up. Uh, one more time for our final. Summer.